and his greatest spy of the head of media presentation. Um, look, um, it, it's a great uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, 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 Professor Herbert Bargang to the Asia Research Center, and you know the Asia Research Center has had a long and a productive relationship with uh, uh, with Professor Bargang. But, uh, but I, 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 um, just talking to him, bringing him to to Murdoch, I realised that uh, his relationship with Murdoch goes back to the time that David Goodwin was here in the in the 1980s. I didn't, I didn't know. So he's been, you know, he's been a very regular visitor to Murdoch from from the late 80s onwards. So, um, so, it, so it's, it's you know it's a, a, a great pleasure then to, to welcome you, uh, Bargang. Uh, Bargang is the um, Alfred D. King Professor and Chair of International Relations at the School of Humanities and Social Sciences um, at Deakin University. And he's published extensively. I mean, you see from 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 the uh, from the bio that you have, and he's published extensively on uh, on issues to do with Chinese politics, political change, but more recently around regionalism and regional governance. Uh, he's the author of uh, six uh, single authored books and and over uh, uh, sixty uh, uh, journal articles in highly prestigious uh, journals. Uh, but then even more than that, even more than that, sort of description of his sort of intellectual, um, what do you call it? Intellectual scorecard, if you like, which is uh, which is which is uh, stellar by any standards. I think what's even more important about Bao Gang is that he's one of the most important and innovative thinkers on issues of political change in China. Um, he's widely known for his work on deliberative authoritarianism. Uh, in, in China, uh, and this has become a new way of actually understanding Chinese politics uh, uh, and has had a considerable influence on the, the, the research agenda on, on, on Chinese politics and, 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 and then that analysis of uh, political change in, in China. And, and it's really great, I think, that you know, Australia sometimes tends to be, we tend to be theory takers rather than theory makers in, in the world of social science. And it's really great, I think, to have someone actually, actually making innovative theoretical contributions to the study of Chinese uh, political change. Uh, but more recently, I, I guess he's, he, there's an other side to his work, um, and it's kind of two tracks to, to your work, which is on, on regionalism and regional governance, um, and, and the way it's been shaped by various different normative <coughs> traditions. He's uh, recently published a book on ASEAN and, and regionalism, which is influenced, which is you know, which is influenced by those, uh, 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 by that kind of thinking. And I think that, uh, what I like about this work is that, uh, the, in a sense, at the junction of these two 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 tracks, if you like, it's a, a, it's an effort to understand Chinese politics and and social change on its own terms, rather than in terms of the trajectory of Western Europe and North America. And he's one of the best practitioners, I, I always like to say, of global social science. And in a sense, seeking to grapple with the way in which the rise of China uh, challenges some of the traditional assumptions of political science and international relations. And I'm sure this paper that, that he'll be giving today will be along those lines. Thank you, Bhattar. Thank you, Kenichi. And thank you very much, and thank you, nice introduction. Uh, thank you, everyone. I, it is uh, my great pleasure to share my thoughts. Hopefully, I will get some of your critical, critical criticism or comments. So let, let me just uh, first. I, I really enjoyed my first uh, visit in Modoc. Then I was, uh, then I think that Gunung was put in a nice hotel in Fremantle. <laughs> Immediately, I saw the Indian Ocean first time. I jumped into the water. Suddenly, there yeah, I got a jellyfish. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, such a great feeling. <laughs> I still remember. Uh, uh, this makes me. Uh, the, the, I was stay this time near the beach. I was thinking to go to the water, but I was thinking my first could be a while. Was a jellyfish come out? Like? <laughs> okay, so we are. Uh, this talk is about Chinese uh, one belt one road, but uh, the Chinese government kind of uh, adopt a new term called uh, uh, belt and the road initiative. 
BRO. But I'm, yeah, I'm still use a uh, urban. So it's a it's a thing that the BRO is the same. So my 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 aim of this talk is really try to to look at the uh, domestic politics of the Elba. So if we look at this uh, currently international relation as a discipline, they are writing on the Elba. Uh, the, the, the main focus is the geopolitics, in particular in Australia. The Australian response to Elba largely framed in this uh, uh, geopolitics framework. Then they, they look at Elba as a geopolitical, geosecurity issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there's uh, differences from business sector that we look at as a business opportunity. So what is missing in the current literature study on the Elba is about the Chinese domestic politics. So that is our, our thinking chart to make a, a, a fill the gap, uh, add some understanding of the Chinese domestic politics of the album. So how to understand domestic, so then I, in my paper, I try to look at this issue at the three levels. One is the individual leaders, and, and it's bearing on the album project. And look at this uh, the organization structures to implement album. So that's the one about individual leader, decision making process, uh, implementing organization. That's an aspect, one aspect, Albert. The second aspect uh, uh, aim is to look at this the mobilization of Albert. So the uh, Albert is, uh, is really, is kind of a really massive political mobilization. So I look at this uh, mobilization of Albert from the three aspects, one is at the ministry level, second at the provisional level, third at the state-owned enterprises level. Then last uh, dimension of the part domestic politics is how China manages dissent. There are a lot of criticism on the elder. So how China manages the dissent at home as well as abroad. So this will have an implication for Australia. So China, in order to succeed, uh, Elba is more likely to expand its cultural influences in such a way impact the domestic, domestic politics of receiving country. So, uh, so what I do is look at those three aspects, Chinese domestic politics, look at their implications. So, the, as I said, the, the, the idea is to try to deal with one of the deficiencies in the literature that's the most focused on geopolitics. For me, I think a domestic politics analysis, analysis can enrich a geopolitical analysis. So in the end of the day, geopolitics is a politics. You know, geopolitics is a politics. They only add the GEO in front. <laughs> So, so in the end, so the geopolitics is an extension of domestic politics. If we understand the domestic politics fully, then I'm sure we can understand the geopolitics. But more than geopolitics, the, the impact of the elbows, not only on the geopolitics, but also geoeconomic, even geoculture, like uh, the global uh, cultural heritage issues. So, then the, another way we can think about this domestic politics can enrich uh, geopolitics is look at the uh, uh, internal politics, in particular at the rival between the province. So Chinese economy developed so fast is that one of uh, driving force is the local dynamics. So in the 1819, it is a rival between the village and the township. That makes the Chinese travel very fast. Then later on, there's a rival between the province. Then push Chinese economy development very, very fast. So now, what elders provide a new type of rivals between the province, but not at the Chinese home, but at abroad. The province go to the abroad. They are rivalry. That's another new dimension for to understand Chinese dynamic dynamism. 
The other issue I think is really important for us. So if we want to understand whether Chinese uh, elders was successfully, some project successfully in one country fail in other country, it's really important to understand interactions between two kind of domestic politics. One is the Chinese domestic politics. Another is the domestic politics of receiving country, those receiving aid, receiving investment country. How those two are work together? If those politics work into the same directions and they are easily facilitated our project, implement our project uh, quickly. But if the domestic policy goes to a different direction, then we will not like to see the assistance to the Chinese elbow project. So I think that this is a really help us to understand the, to, to what you to, to, to understand the success of the elbow is not only look at the domestic politics of China, but also domestic politics of other countries. So, so let, let me first just give you some background about Albert. So Albert, uh, according to Dan Stanberg, he written an article, he said, Albert complete both the Marshall Plan. So if, we, if you like, so if I make a very simple uh, uh, analogy. So Marshall Plan is uh, like an apple. That's a $13 billion apple. But uh, the Albert, is it look like uh, a, a watermelon. <laughs> it's really a trillion dollar a watermelon. <laughs> so that's our differences. Okay. So then uh, one of the, it's really important is on the current uh, Xi Jinping's leadership. So he different from previous government under the Wen Jiabao, who, who did talk. At that time, they are focused on what they call APT. That is the ASEAN plus three. So largely Chinese focus is APT. That's full foreign policy energies on that. Then when Xi Jinping come to power, one of the, uh, his uh, uh, initiatives is global scale. They call it global, global Asia. Not, not only focus on the APT. APT is small issue, money. So he wants to do, uh, make the Chinese project globally, truly. So one of the behind this uh, album is, uh, is trying to make China from a wood factory into a wood builder. So China is a kind of wood factory. Major, major products are made in China. Made in China is the way everyone knows. But now they want to the build by China. So it's, a, it's quite understandable that first China have a $1.2 trillion dollar. Um, stay in America, buy American bond, one trillion, one point two. Sometimes even a few years ago, they nearly two trillion dollars. Then they have uh, overproduced uh, steel, cement, stay in China, idol. And uh, then they have a lot of construction company could not find a job to do. So there were three things. They have money, they have a material, they have a manpower. Then the other country, like Bangladesh, Pakistan, but in particular Bangladesh, I went there last year, Myanmar. They desperately need someone help to build the railway, build the highway, build the port. So, so one side you have a demand side, the other side they can supply. So those two match immediately and China can develop those large scale projects, not only in South South Asia, but also in the Central Asia, many Central Asia. In particular, the one of the, in the, another area is a post-communist uh, East, East European country, like Poland, uh, Hungary, they de desperately need uh, investment. So, so by doing so, the China is not, one is the China, uh, when you said you're doing so, China might also export its own problem to the other places. But there's another as a kind of consequences. So by doing so, then the China also try to build its own kind of pro pro global production supply. The global uh, kind of uh, su supply network. 
really focus on this uh, uh, port, global port, connect all the maritime uh, link together. So it's a, it's a, it's a really uh, uh, very ambitious global project. Link the city to cities, country to countries, then very impressive continent to continent. So it's a really large link those uh, Europe and Asia together. So they, so far they have uh, six corridors. So here they just uh, list of the one belt, one road. But then uh, so far the one is already going on. That's in Pakistan. China already put $16 billion to build uh, uh, highway and uh, railways, fast track railway from the China to the, the Pakistan, across from north to south. Then go to the Indian Ocean. So, so what the China really doing is uh, is kind of um, develop a certain a new kind of model, uh, what I call the Chinese infrastructure exporting model. So if you compare the Japanese when in the 1990s, so when the Japan the economy accumulated a certain stage, they have a surplus capital like the China today is the same. So then they uh, went to the Asia, built the subsidiary factory to produce these uh, electronic products. So in, in across Asia, more than 500 the factories that produce something for Japanese company. But uh, unlike Japan, China does not hold technology leadership in this kind of electronic products car. But in the last decades, China uh, really accumulated a lot of knowledge and successfully built a huge dam, the fast strip railway. So they were successful in those areas. So then Chinese figured out the best way for them to do, rather than competing with Japan to kind of make, uh, make the electronic products. Then they, they tried to go to the infrastructure, they export infrastructure everywhere. So that infrastructure, that product is really different from this. If you produce this uh, uh, electronic product, like Samsung still today, like in Korea, Samsung in a factory in Indonesia. So you only produce uh, one product. So you assemble 500, 600 workers in one factory. But a Chinese product is kind of aggregate product. That's a area called the road, dam, highway, pass bridge train. That involve us. Our idea of the technology involve the, that we involve some in industrial sector, but they also have a products, the investment, aid, and trade. So it's everything put together. It's a, it's a, it's a holistic, aggregate uh, project. It's different from like Korea, Japanese in the old days. So that infrastructure export be, uh, model immediately have uh, two significant implications. One implication is a peace building. Because to, in order to Chinese export this infrastructure successful, definitely need a peace, a regional peace. If there's a disruption and uh, they build a railway, suddenly there's a war, then they waste all the money. So they make sure there's a peace prevail across all the region. So that's a consequence. Then the, the, the other consequence is uh, it, uh, obvious. It will strengthen state capitalism. So if you think this go back to the 19th century at that time, so that when the Europe built the railway in the British, in France, in the Germany, in Europe, the, 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 the British at that time was kind of private factory, predominant, built the railway, very fast, very efficient. Then French want, France wanted to do the same thing, but they failed the, through these uh, private enterprises. So then French developed this state capitalism, state to guarantee pro, to build this railway. So, the, so in the European context, when they build railway, you have two models. One is to represent the British private dominant capital, <coughs> and then the French state dominant capital. 
So today is the same, the same story that kind of American, the global domination of American company, largely a private. But the Chinese, the, uh, those uh, top 500 uh, 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 company in the fortune, this year Chinese uh, um, already reached uh, 150. So nearly a, a, a fifth of the top 100 companies already in, in China, the Chinese company. But all those SOE, state-owned company. And uh, this year, the Chinese had uh, nearly 565 billionaires. The number of the Chinese billionaires is larger than American billionaires. So, so, so this is the consequence. The, the, the way they're doing the uh, export, this infrastructure, as a logical consequence, you will be private in the private company cannot do it. So you need a state to organize. Then we call this uh, China really is a fascinating for us. Just go back to the Kinesic's early points, this uh, challenge of political science. Is that China developed this 21st century uh, version of the party state capital in the large scale. And this is the post really significant challenge for us to understand it. Also to challenge a classical uh, doctrines in many, many uh, disciplines, including in political science. So, so what, what is this? Uh, one of the example is uh, like the Revin Hill. Revin Hill in his uh, international political economy literature, he writes that this, when the uh, Japan kind of export uh, industry to Southeast Asia, invest in Southeast Asia, and uh, Revin Hill found that there's a, a, a regionalized production network has been developed. Doing so, it undermines state capacity. So state power has been constrained. But uh, if we think about this conclusion, look at con con contemporary China. China actually is a strengthened, this is the elbow, is a strengthened the state central policy and the strength. Chinese government become more and more powerful. And, uh, but at the same time, it's really interesting. It's very, that this, uh, uh, it's, it's really important, I uh, think, is that to understand this Chinese, uh, how the Chinese, this SOE, as a new driving force, has also constrained the executive power. It constrained the top leadership. Despite the Xi Jinping's preference, go to the mosque all the way. But he cannot go to mosque all the way completely. He has to coexist with the state capital. The state capital is already constrained. There's a no choice for him to go back to cultural revolution. He can go back to cultural revolution in a different way, kind of tighten the ideological country. But in the economic area, there's no way to go back to most uh, economic policy. So here it's, a, it's a really interesting for us you know, to understand how is a, in the future of the China, Chinese future decided by two groups. One is a 300 Central Party Committee. Uh, that's, uh, that's a, they just called it the 19 Party Congress. Those are top 100, 200, 300. The other, another is close to 600 billionaires. They were access great economic influence, plus cultural political influence. How those two group interaction decide the future of the China. So if we, if we look at this, uh, go back to this Elba. Elba is a large scale state control, state investment. So I, I, I think this uh, symbolizes this kind of really authoritarian model of investment. So if we compare this uh, uh, Marshall Plan, American Marshall Plan, $13 billion after the Second World War, but that, that the way the American implement Marshall Plan, they, they is uh, led by the, uh, the Secretary of State, and uh, they have to face the Congress. <coughs> Congress have a final approval. And uh, then they are dominated by the private uh, capitalist. So at that time, 
Each city in Europe will be have a one CEO from private capital. So he will stay in the one city, call it everything. So, but in China, it's not just private company; it's a real estate company there. So that's a difference. So, so this model, this Chinese model of kind of investments, it really have several of these kind of feature. I, I highlight that. One is the really importance of top individually, individually very important. And the other politics of mobilization, we will come to this uh, issue again in a minute. And the politics control, state capitalism, domination of SOE, and also there's some the confusion accountability. So there are lack of public accountability. So public Chinese citizens have uh, no rights to request detailed information about elder. But then there are certain accountability. There's the people at the bottom accountable to the top leader. So that's what we call it confusion accountability. So let, let, let's just look at this, uh, go back to the three aspects of the domestic politics. One aspect is the politics of individual leader, leading group, and the decision-making process. So Xi Jinping currently the party secretary. So he regarded Elba as his personal baby, his personal invention. It's a legacy-defined project. So this is his legacy. So if we compare the early leader, like Jiang Zemin, his legacy is a three representative. Hu Jintao, his legacy is a scientific development. So one of his legacy, he will see this He's pushed China on the global stage through this album. So he said uh, Xi Jinping has a centralized foreign policy decision making process. And uh, he said this is a way for him to, to hold on power. If the elbow requires five or 15 years, then this will provide a, a best justification for him staying on power. Because uh, <coughs> Follow the pre-Chinese uh, politics, they already introduced two-term rule. Each leader only have a two-term, that's each term five years. So currently, Xi Jinping is more likely to try to abandon those two terms. And Albert provided a very, very strong justification for him to do so. If he to do so, Chinese people, most people will accept it because, okay, this will bring the Chinese at another stage and it will make Chinese a lot, uh, a great again. So in this kind of provides this kind of justification. So why we said this is important that individually is important because he sees this is his own initiative is important. But at the same time, we need a, 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 a sort of qualifications. So some project, it's already happened before Xi Jinping came to power. So, so he just renamed, I'll call this uh, Elba. So one of the issues is there's a lot of initiative come from this uh, national uh, uh, government organization, come from the province. And uh, so, so if the Xi Jinping is gone, so probably we will say some elements of Elba will continue. So there we will see is kind of follow the logic of this uh, uh, international political economy development. So when the country re reaches a certain stage, so they need to export their surprise capital, technology, go everywhere. So that's logic will be there. So despite she's gone, the, some parts of Elba will go. But certainly the way you implement Elba will be different. Currently, because Xi Jinping is sees it as a personal uh, uh, baby, he's pushed very hard to implement it. So another issue is probably I need to highlight. This is uh, kind of um, uh, it's not uh, official position, but it's the probably Xi Jinping is more likely will take this as uh, uh, as for kind of uh, granted. So that's kind of theoretical foundation why we need this elbow. So 
So behind this ID is this kind of rival, the bipolar world. So they, they see the China and the United States rivalry. And through this Elba, China will become one critical polar in global order. So this is the person, if he's a uh, <coughs> he had written a book on this thesis, and he even written a submit, uh, a, a report, to ask the top leader, Xi Jinping, to establish a leading group to, to, to facilitate Elba to make it fast happen, quickly. So when he summit in the March in 2015, and uh, then uh, in the late, only a few, a few months later, the she issued an order, establishes what they call the leading small group for advancing the development of the One Belt, One Road. So they form this uh, uh, a leading group. So what's happened, uh, Xi Jinping at the top, he has uh, one group, the Central Leadership Group for Foreign Affairs, he's a leader. And uh, through this group, then they control this uh, a small group, advance the development of one bell, one loop. After this group, uh, uh, all the top leaders, Zhang Gaoli, the uh, Purdue Bureau Standing Committee member, he's a uh, 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 head of that small group. So Wang Yang, the vice premier, is also is a, a, a leading member. And uh, one, one of the, it's quite an interesting issue is uh, there are the top five <coughs> members uh, uh, in the leading group. So one of the issues is really interesting is that uh, when they develop elders, they face an extremely uh, challenge issue of the coordination. So many things happen at the same time. Just I already mentioned this, you got the money, you got this uh, overproduct steel that involves SOE, but also involves construct company. But it also involves this uh, China, other country, the continental, ocean, and the government, and the enterprise. So you need to coordinate. So that one of the job, one other guy, Yang Jing, his job is to do the coordination. And uh, so they have this, this uh, leading group. Um, this, this group, where they will be, they set up the office. Office will be in the National Development and Reform Commission. So this National Development and Reform Commission is a ministerial level. That is a legacy of the making a plan. They all make a plan. So this organization, together with the Ministry of Commerce, uh, and uh, also Ministry of the Foreign Affairs. Those three ministers, uh, three ministries work together. They, they produce the uh, action plan, mission plan in the March 2015. So then since then they implement. So one way if you compare the, this uh, uh, Marshall Plan, Marshall Plan, everything you must go through this uh, Congress. But uh, that's the Chinese Congress, National People's Congress. So if you look at the behavior of deputy, you know, they are completely different American the congressmen. Congressmen will question, where you use money, how, is it efficient? But here I look at the, uh, I look at the website, all the deputies said, how great is Albert? Why are we important? <laughs> so how all the, it's a really different way of operating. <laughs> Uh, I think I, I skip on the uh, question of the law of the PLA. So I think I think a conscious way of maybe try to give more, more time for discussions. So let's look go, go here. The second aspect of uh, politics is called mobilization. That's uh, amazing. China is kind of this Elba is it's really big. the state uh, initiative pro implement then mobilize all the ministries. So take an example like the Ministry of Education. And in many universities in Australia, those vice chancellor, deputy vice chancellor, already have a personal experiences with this uh, Ministry of Education. They were more like invited by the Ministry of Education to attend the Albert Forum, develop university collaboration. Then there's the Ministry of Culture. They issue documents, but they focus on cultural exchanges. 
And then the second level is at the province level. So each province will issue the action plan. So their ID, the origin of the ID is really make the uh, ALBA is uh, important uh, kind of to address the regional unbalance. The China has been developed in the coast area very fast, but in the central uh, west area is very left behind. So they want to build this ALBA link to make the Xinjiang province uh, a, 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 a center of economic activity in the central area, link the Xinjiang with the Central Asian country. So then they want to make the Fujian link with the maritime country. So what's happened is really interesting. The, the, someone did an empirical study look at the participation index rates of look at all the countries. So all the active province actually at the moment are co still coast area province. Guangdong province is, for example, they are the number one Guangdong province. And amazingly, Guangdong province is really amazing. So Guangdong province is a party section currently. He developed a one-to-one a, a -one scheme. There's one city in Guangdong province will link to one country in Pacific Island state. So then they develop all the project one to one, one city with one country. And they develop a large scale project. They also train about 70 uh, um, people from the Pacific Island state. They provide uh, airfare, accommodation, travel to China, look at the Chinese business sector. <coughs> So it's a sort of a build the networking connection for their business. And uh, then another uh, um, mobilization is the SOE. So they will mobilize SOEs to go to, 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 to participate in Albert. And one of the is really interesting that they did a risk analysis. There's among those 56 uh, um, countries. The many countries are designated a risk, high risk area. But at the end, they will develop the project anyway. And the, those companies who went there are SOE, state owned, not the private, reluctant to go ahead. And the, the other issue is kind of management of dissents. There, there's a sound, a lot of criticism. But as a, at the home, Chinese was successful in managing dissents. But at the, at the abroad, that's typical, new challenging issue. One of the fascinating issues there so far is going on is uh, how to manage the media report in Pakistan. So basically, Chinese way is a buy off. It's give a lot of money to the report, always a lot of good stories about the Elvis. So, so, so far, they are doing quite well in that aspect. So the domestically, so they are tough control. I, I personally involved this kind of try to do organize a, a conference with the Chinese university. They are told that no academic conference was allowed before the May, the Alba summit. So before the summit, no conference. The, the Chinese government worried about maybe someone might be speaking, put forward some criticism. They don't want to hear that. They only want to hear the good one, the good, good news. And the other issue is really interesting. The, we call the they, they are standardized this year uh, in July. That is the, they call the one bell, one load initiative. So then they forbid it to use one bell, one load strategy. It is not strategy, it's an initiative. So the idea is to play down some of the ge geopolitics consideration. But the, in doing so, and the geopolitics have become more and more stronger. <laughs> so, and the other thing is uh, the Chinese scholar cannot access the data and uh, say like the Chinese aid in Pacific Island. So Chinese scholar rely on the Australian scholar. <laughs> uh, so how the, what's the this, uh, implication of the Chinese domestic politics? One is that we say already the politics of prison that is always say celebrate too. It's how great so far successful. So very little discussion in the problems. And uh, then there are also, there's always different agencies competing for his favor. And uh, 
there's a politics of seeking funding. So they try to repair <laughs> everything. The, some project which was not the Alba, but they said this is Alba. In their way, they try to get money from the center. And uh, so I think I said, so if you look at this, this uh, Chinese, uh, this the way they're doing the things, this is kind of really centralized investment uh, project, uh, the model. There's some uh, advantage for China to do so. There's a low level of executive constraints. And then they allow for more profitability, monopolistic deals to occur. And then the Chinese company can take the high risk, even some that get high return. Some that even, even the zero return, they, they can also accept it. And uh, they can mono monopolize all resources to do to the unthinkable project. It's the largest success. Oh, they can do it. So in the area of consequence, it's more likely to increase the in influence of individual leaders. So I kind of Albert maybe give a, a count the party sector Xi Jinping extra uh, the way to consolidate his power. It also multiplies the influence of the China through the scale and mobilization. There are some disadvantages of the Chinese investment model. So it is a, it's political control and lack of transparency. Increase the fear and worry of other countries, including Australia. And a Chinese project more likely to encounter difficult and resistant. <coughs> so one of the things is really interesting. China so far received a few kind of accountable protests in a few countries in Central Asia, in the Pacific Islands. But if you compare in 1990, Japan in South Asia, at that time, Japan faced a widespread protest of this system. So that's, it's, it's, a, it's worthwhile to explore this issue further, why there are some differences. Maybe Chinese state has not arrived. There's a more kind of push, then they will see more protests were going on, like the Japan in comes to those protests. So then, then there's another thing is a waste of money. So one study found that between 2005 <coughs> to 2014, 25% of all Chinese projects abroad failed. So accumulatively, those 32 ventures cost over 56 billion US dollars. So this is really interesting. If China, China, China were democratized, if Chinese citizens were given an opportunity to, 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 to make a decision, along the Elba. It's more likely they will choose that to the, that to the end of the Elba. They will stop the Elba. So, so by this logic, it's, it's really intriguing, very intriguing. So Elba's, this project, actually require or this further strengthen this authoritarian system. And because of the democratization process will weaken it implementation of health from the eyes of Beijing. So let me just make some uh, conclusion now, remarks. The one is that is that implementation of and uh, this kind of is more kind of is, the trend is towards more authoritarian. So this have an implication for China. So the China will probably will say this behind the current Xi Jinping's 19 party congress his centralized power, and is a put economic logic, Elba, push that one further. But that also have an implication for the receiving country. There will be impact, those uh, impact in South Asia, Southeast Asia, for their political system. The, the second thing, the mobilization, Elba, look the more likely, uh, it's called the politics, rather than pure economic activity. But then the issue is uh, to implement the album. There's always a tension between economic consideration and the geopolitical consideration. These are always in conflict. SOEs, 
some all SOE are based in the United States, uh, America, New York. They have uh, economic interests, don't waste the money. So some they tend to resist some order from top. And uh, Chinese uh, authoritarian model of investment has both advantage and a dis disadvantage. And uh, then there's a one of the interesting, if you can say, in the, the impact of silence. So domestically, there's a hierarchical authoritarian. But uh, if you look at this at a board, they are very lenient. In particular, if you look at the uh, SIPA, that is the Chinese China Pakistan Economic Corridor Project, Chinese give them a lot of money. And uh, the, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. So, so there's a, the, the issue, the key issues currently is going on, there's a dilemma going on that between size of Elba. I said it's a water million, actually you can see the huge. That is nearly the overall kind of one trillion dollar. But then the ability of state to manage. The, the, the state manages such large scale. It's, it's, it's always this uh, inherent retention difficulty. Then this system always re requires a small group to manage such big project. But uh, if those small group, if they work 24, 24 hours a day, suppose they are healthy, they can work 24 hours a day, and it's a 30 day a month, they cannot cope with so many issues. So many issues come up. But at the same time, the system will not open. Cannot open that can give the other people also involved. So there will be really kind of in, in another kind of difficulties in the, the, in the process of uh, implementation of uh, ELBA. So welcome your criticism and the comments. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, but, but before we throw it over for discussion, I should have mentioned at the start that uh, um, uh, this is a joint uh, uh, collaboration with the Confucius Institute, of course, and um, um, Bargain was uh, last night um, uh, at a seminar at UWA with the, uh, organized by the Confucius Institute. So thank you very much to the uh, Confucius Institute for, for, uh, for jointly organizing this with us. Okay, um, we, we have about now um, 35, 40 minutes. Uh, um, I, I might just collect a few. Uh, I might just collect a few questions and then, yeah, then love you to to respond to, to those issues. Jeff, thanks, Michael. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something that you, you did mention in, in your talk about the geopolitics side of it. You know, the big controversy in a country like Australia is: do we get involved at the moment? And a lot of the, the talk that comes out of this, particularly if you listen to our alliance partners in America, is that you know this is something that's going to put China on a collision course with the status quo in the region, whether that's America, Japan, etc., etc. But there's an analysis of the BRIs, the, you know, they're now calling it, that actually says this is designed to avoid that problem. And this is the, what one you see's idea about going west. Yes. Look closer down to where it's this notion that. Uh, and it's prevalent in China that the Asia Pacific, so Southeast Asia, Australia, the Pacific Islands, are kind of an American patch in the global system. And so what China needs to do is if it tries to extend these things into Southeast Asia, they're going to collide with Americans. So what we need to do is go west instead, into Central Asia, South Asia, some places in North Africa, which is why both of the Belt and the Road go in the western direction. So some defenders of this would say, in fact, what China's trying to do is avoid confrontation with Western powers and security actors by going in a different direction to places that American companies and American defence installations aren't presently, and that that's actually going to mitigate some of those tensions and make it easier for Australia to participate because it's, it's not that Hugh White China versus America choice necessarily in that respect. Yeah. Thank you for a uh, very insightful presentation. Um, my question relates to the fact that infrastructure is really uh, lumpy, expensive, uh, the rate of return is over a long time horizon, not a short one. Yeah, yeah. And by your admission, a lot of those investments, 25% or so on, have failed. So my question in a sense is, uh, who owns the debts and what are the long-term implications, both for the SOEs and also for the recipient governments who also carry some of those debts in, in many cases? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
is there not a risk that um, traffic too many of these fail, there will be a major crisis, uh, perhaps for the SOEs in China, but also for some of the individual countries involved. Yeah. And just one. Uh, Professor, India is a um, strong critic uh, and a country that's quite important, or very much smaller in power than India. Can you comment on the, uh, the, the, the Pakistan-China link and the, the necessity of balancing political uh, dissent with, with India through Kashmir area and the, and the economic experience and, and military experience going that link to the Indian Ocean? Okay, so uh, thank you, the This uh, one, one is the professor at Beijing University, so his idea is that it, we, rather than confront with the United States, we went to Western side, go to Central Asia. But uh, that's uh, economy is a scholarly, scholarly wish for the thinking. So if you think about the, the way that China, just uh, China, 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 they want to, there's uh, so many suppers, the money there. So money is still there. And then they go, they want to do project everywhere. So there's a, uh, there, there are certain aspects of that. They are fully focused on the Central Asia. So uh, then, the, then the American avoid the direct confront. But at the same time, the China's, the, the expanded its traditional influence, expanded the influence in South Asia. Chinese civilization, as a civilization, is never going to South Asia. You know, always stop in South Asia. But they, they have influence in Southeast Asia. But when it comes to South Asia, their influence is stop, stop. But this time they are expanding. And that's the comeback they say India. India worried about the Chinese influence. So, so then the, there are some that consider, uh, some of the Chinese scholars think that the, just uh, the Chinese is, uh, domestic politics is considered its own economic issue, own economic survival, economic success, another source of uh, uh, economic development. So, and uh, we are less concerned with security. But the other scholars think that none of the, that we should honest about the, the consequence of that. They, they will be having geopolitics implications. So one of the issues I think is in, in, in the Australian case, uh, uh, the, uh, Australia dominated by geopolitics. So the, uh, uh, the one, one of the issues I was thinking this is that the, um, there, there's no way for Australia, you can, or other American or Europe, you can stop Chinese those Elvis project. They will go. Despite your opposition, they will go anyway. This is, uh, they, they have so many but still money there. They need some the market the, to do the things. That's a logic. So, so the, the one of the issue is try to find a way to do the collaboration in the, some of the project. That's the, this, this, this is the one of the option. But come back to this, uh, this uh, infrastructure, the, uh, this uh, long term is a uh, who own the debt. This is a, the, the debt issue will be uh, really issues that actually my people have discussed that so because China controls those uh, scholarly study. So far, Chinese scholars haven't studied this critical issue: how address the debt, how the receiving country pay back. The no serious stuff. Then also there's a debt trap. So when so if you think about the Pakistan, Philippines, Bangladesh, they already uh, 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 have a huge debt from the World Bank, from the United States. So then World Bank are reluctant to lend them more because then you can't pay back. Then China comes, they give them more money. But then there's more debt. So how solve this problem is a serious issue. And uh, so far, Chinese, is, uh, that is the uh, Chinese so far figure out the one way is because uh, they, they are, uh, at the moment, they are considered this a geopolitics issue. So the way they, in Pakistan, they said they are able to get access to Indian Ocean. That's a great advantage for them. 
because even at the economic cost, but they can get in excess in the ocean. In the worst case, have a war between the United States and China. They are able to bypass the Pacific. They still get the oil supply from the Indian Ocean, then close to the Pakistan, directly go to inland go to China. So that's the uh, they are considered that one. So it's uh, overriding this pure kind of economic cost. So India, India, China, Pakistan, China, the, the original China tried to get India, Pakistan in this uh, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So both uh, become full members this year. So the idea behind when China wants to get them in is try to reduce their rivalry and uh, then create a favorable condition in which China can facilitate, speed up Albert project. But the way so, so far the, the way got is that China, India is resist. So India is, uh, thinks this is, uh, the issue is a dispute the issue, the Kashmir. So India uh, resist Chinese project. India not only resist uh, uh, protests against this Chinese elbow in Pakistan, but also uh, uh, lobby quite successful in Bangladesh. So the Bangladesh government actually listened to India. Because when the Bangladesh current government was uh, elected in 2015, uncontested, and uh, Europe, the United States also criticized this unfair election. Even the United States was uh, refused to recognize their government. But India was the first to recognize that the government, even before the election, support their government. So the, their government really rely on the India. So, so in their case, the, their government, so far their government is really, uh, 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 if you look at this, uh, very interesting, look at this, uh, the, the number of the money uh, those countries receive, Pakistan receives huge. But uh, the fact that so little, the, the Chinese investment there is only ranking 13. Well, when I was there last year, they said they are, there's so much money from China, but they don't know how to use it, and they don't dare to use it. So, so, so the, but largely is kind of because the uh, India's opposition. India don't want Pakistan to get too close to China. But the, the need of, for India, to, for China to secure its routes through the Indian Ocean from Djibouti all the way through to Malacca Straits is important. So can India stop that? Uh, India, India no one can stop. They already, already built uh, uh, highways, already it's going on. There's railways <coughs> going on. There's no way they can stop. And uh, the more likely, and uh, there's a further project we're going on in Myanmar, Bangladesh too. So. You were just talking about the fact that um, the uh, Chinese, uh, or I mean, sorry, India is worried about the loss of Pakistan giving China access to the North West Indian Ocean. But recently, it's been reported in the press that China has acquired a naval base yeah. from uh, in, in Sri Lanka. Yeah, China. And I wonder what implications you think that has for the South West Indian Ocean, which is our part of the yeah, this, uh, this, uh, yeah, I'll just get it on there. Yeah, uh, we've talked about the SOEs getting rid of their excess capacity and the role of the state. What role or what future in this OBOR is there for commercial private companies like Huawei, the VAT companies, for instance, Alibaba? Are they cheerleaders for this project? Yeah. Just one more, um, please. This, uh, so the India, this uh, um, Sri Lanka, this uh, go back this debt issue. So Sri Lanka is a uh, huge debt. So how to, to address this issue? The one of these is uh, give China a share. So the, the port, China, I think it got this time got 60% of the share of their own their port. So that's the way to address the debt issue. 
and uh, it, it's uh, so one, one of the ways so uh, China so far is uh, it's it's quite the it's a uh, because you 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 own so much money to China and in their way. China, we China able to access key strategic types like port, navy, and also road. So even this uh, highway and the, the, the build the highway, actually Chinese company own certain percentage of share there. So as this is the way to address the debt issue. So there's, we can see uh, a bit of more Chinese control there. Uh, SOEs and uh, plus private companies, and uh, so what? Well, so, so this is the it's a, because you develop such large scale project. Private company cannot make a first move. Your your state make the first move. So it's two state make a deal, build something. So after that, then the private. Uh, enterprises involved, like Huawei. So when when you already decided to build something there, then the, the Huawei move in, and then the uh, kind of designing company move in, all the private. So the private enterprises play the uh, supporting secondary role. And the state SOEs and the government play the initiative, secure the uh, contract. So when you do the big contract, get that one, then the private can do the small one. So there's a lot of the private company involved at the moment. It's a, for them, it's a such good opportunity, you will not miss it. But, uh, but too highly scary, they will not move ahead first. They will move the first. That's always as we move first. Can I just come in on that and um, ask a related question in a sense? Uh, so when we think about the, the BRI, the OBOR, or whatever the kind of, <laughs> kind of term is, um, do we run the risk of um, making the assumption that, that the, this is all a kind of a unified strategy, that there are, there are no <coughs> tensions there or conflicts within the state on, over some of these issues? You know, because um, I, I, was, I was interested in some of the comments made by the governor of the, the People's, uh, People's Bank where he was talking about debt, for example, yes. that, that China really needs to, you know, very much like our, our, be, uh, our BA government, in fact, you know, as we say, um, we've got to be really concerned about debt, you know, because this is, this is potentially something that could destabilise the, 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 the economy. But he was also responding to obviously to political and social forces within China. I mean, some of those private businesses who are concerned about the the big state or state enterprises in in in, in this project. So, so I guess my question is, both in terms of China, the kind of contestation and conflict within the state apparatus within China, and and to the extent that they they represent different social forces, but also the the contest within. Uh, within receiving states, you know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Myanmar, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. I mean, it's, it's interesting that the key domestic political issues now have to do with Chinese infrastructure projects, and again, it, it feeds into different kinds of capitalist class interests in in those in, in those states. So, so in a sense, it, you know, it, instead of a kind of a unified strategy or initiative, what you're seeing is a more complex, contradictory right. set of pressures, uh, both on the Chinese leadership, but also in, in terms of the politics that's playing out in, yeah, in the receiving country. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So the, we, we see the, uh, there's a certain level of right. There's a China, uh, I mentioned in my conclusion, I mentioned there's a, internal tensions. So there's a several way to uh, analyze those intentions. One way, as I uh, might mention, is objectives. There's a uh, two dimension going on. One is uh, several sectors, like uh, SOE, even some the Ministry of Commerce, Trade, really want to uh, look at the issues real pure economic benefit. But then the PLA 
and the Chinese security organization look at more local security. They willing to uh, sacrifice certain economic benefit for its strategy. So that's a tension going on. So when they at the operational level, there's constant attention going on. At the at operation level, say example, the company went there. So in the end of the day, they have to face this another organization that's audit. Then if you lose money, I got trouble. So they have to meet this target, the profit, the certain level. So that's a, that's a lot of tension going on. And uh, it's uh, the one of the really challenging issue. I, I think this uh, this you mentioned the capitalist class, cap capitalist. There's a different form of capitalism going. One is uh, just mentioned this uh, SOE, the the private. How they can? Uh, one, so far we say there's uh, state SOE go ahead, then the, the private move in. But uh, then the other. So if you think of the American model, it's a private company more in and step it out, then they are more, so it's a whole project managing more efficient way. So the first issue is uh, making money. So the infrastructure uh, export model, the American is an early explorer on this issue. And uh, so did the uh, uh, Japanese government and the South, uh, uh, South Korea. So what they did, they did, uh, they did also build a certain infrastructure in South Asia. And, uh, America did certain way in the uh, uh, Middle East. But they forgot this only once, one shot for strategic purpose. The same like that, for security. So they willing to put the money, waste the money, the matter for, for security. The same one, but one shot. But then they found that this is, cannot last. <laughs> so, so now the Chinese are kind of build up this issue, take it as an economic, uh, kind of two things together. One is as an economic project, at the same time also as an economic project, all together. So we don't know what, what the Chinese government with this time will succeed. They might, the one of the logic is that you, if you put it up, uh, uh, the American Japanese a long time ago figured out if you put the money on the infrastructure, you waste our money. The, 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 the return is so low. Long then goes something else. But the Chinese, is, uh, so far, there's, uh, the, so far this is, they found this is good. They are, they, they, they are really good at this area. So they will go ahead. So, so, so the future will tell whether China are able to kind of uh, define the American, Japanese, Korea, still make this success story. Um, we don't know, maybe failure story. Kim? Okay. Okay, um, your answer to Jeff's question made me think about um, that this is maybe not just uh, something about a movement moving west, but a more broader policy of the Chinese government to think about infrastructure in other parts of the world. And here I was thinking about the Caribbean and Latin America, in other words, almost ignoring this Monroe Doctrine rhetoric, yeah. and the purchase of sort of the Nicaraguan government and the new Panama Canal in Nicaragua. It seems to me it's more than just a movement west, but something broader. Yes, so right. if you had a comment on that. And then secondly, um, sort of taking on from what Mishka was saying, maybe taking it a little further. I mean, I don't want to be cynical, but when the United States was thinking about or was acting its own interest, um, you know, the politics of how that was perceived in countries didn't really matter so much because the U.S. Was, had its desires and had its goals and it was going to move forward with that. And I'm sort of wondering if China's going to necessarily be more receptive to those internal domestic politics in Sri Lanka and elsewhere. I, I'm thinking not. And I'm, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we just try to see whether we can yeah. get another, another question. Yes, I'm from Myanmar. Normally from Myanmar. Now, the, the, what really interests me that the influence uh, the, the, and the determination uh, by the Chinese state, whatever you said now, a prototype exists in Burma. You, you know what I'm trying to get at? The, uh, most of the thinking, even now, Burma is supposed to be democratizing. Yeah, yeah. We have our problems. Yeah. The 
experimentation, even before the OVO was done, the OVO was experiment, experimented yeah. by the Chinese state. Yeah. Okay. And uh, now, we, we are the baby. Yeah. They, they can't just throw us away. What I'm trying to say is that now in Burma, uh, the, the policy from the military state, the dictatorial state, it is supposed to be heading towards so-called democracy. Yeah. But we can't do anything. Now, the same thing with geopolitics, right? We are trapped between India, China, and Pakistan. Yeah, that's, yeah, China. that's my, my, my Thank you. Uh, just one more before John. Yeah, I, I just, um, of course, China's had a lot of experience with the South-South cooperation, and particularly projects in Africa, yeah. and uh, this infrastructure model. Uh, and as I understand it, that's been a mixed success. Yeah, some, yeah. some good benefits in some places, but it's actually very difficult to take those the methods, the people into different cultures, and then implement them yeah. in a peaceful, easy, easy way. Yeah. I just wonder if, um, uh, whether China's learned from that experience, and how, is that informing the way they want to apply uh, in the current uh, Belt and Road Initiative? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this uh, first is uh, mm, uh, China is uh, moving towards West and moving forward. Certainly, I would say that China is really moving global. Uh, Xi Jinping's strategy is really global, globalized strategy rather than narrowly one. So even this. Uh, there was a research institute called the Asia Pacific Research Institute. This will be a name called uh, Global uh, and uh, Asia Pacific Study. And so that's the problem we will see is kind of China. It's a, it's a, it's a, this go back to the crucial the early points. It's a really a, a transnational rise of capital. That's a, this is the logic. Because this logic, so Chinese go everywhere, rather than uh, confined by one geo geographic location. So then the, with the, the other issue that so you see that when you, the, the issue with the China with kind of how to deal with the domestic politics of the receiving country. I so American public at the moment sometimes impose something, you know, disregard the domain. So, so, uh, the one of uh, one, one of the things I, I think in the next uh, few years, China will be more and more develop a new subtle way influence the domestic political in, in receiving country, and it probably we will see more like through those uh, lobby local official, even they increase the corruptions to get the things they want. So the what, what so far the China really discovers that those election alternative government sometimes create opportunity for China can speed up certain things. So now they are trying to learn new ways to 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 see. So this is a really fascinating research project if we can compare Russia and China, how those two authoritarian states try to influence electoral politics globally. That's a new research issue. In the old days, this never be issue. But now this will be issue. And uh, it's a will stay with us. And the logic probably come, come back to this explanation of earlier points. Logic is a purely transnational capitalism. Their logic is there. That will be further and further deeper. What is it? You know, this is logic. Um, the Myanmar, yes, uh, certainly the, you are right. They said Myanmar is caught between geopolitics kind of India, Pakistan, and China. And uh, the one, one interesting thing we will see is that China tried to promote peace among those rebellion groups. Uh, this year, they bring those rebellion groups from north, went to the capital city, make a deal. So the, this is come back to my early points. China have kind of is it, is it, they, they really want to ensure a peace environment. So that because this infrastructure. This is, a, this is a, if we compare America and China, if you America have the largest uh, arm export in the world, America. So American foreign policy is sometimes is more destabilized, the more benefit for this uh, uh, arm export industry. 
But for China, then the, 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 the only piece can benefit this uh, infrastructure export. So that might be slight differences. It's, uh, um, this uh, uh, this uh, South South cooperation and also mixed success in Africa. Now, I I, I think this uh, one of the criticism on the Alba um, is is that uh, why the CJPU? Why don't you do some experimentation? Why just push so fast? Mm -hmm. But uh, the, that criticism miss one critical point. Mm -hmm. China already did experiment in Africa. Those infrastructure project. China did a, a decades ago in Africa, mm -hmm. and a mixed success. So, so the differences between this uh, come back to this Japan, United States, Korea. They also did the infrastructure mm -hmm. project in South Asia, but they didn't go ahead. But uh, China did uh, some project in Africa. They figured out they can make the money. They can make the money. That's important. They, they already make certain money. So then they say, sure, they will continue to make the money. So that, that's one of the issues. The, the issue they want to uh, uh, and, uh, solve the Chinese domestic problems through this album. Now, this, this is a, not an export to the Chinese problem. It's a solve the Chinese domestic problem mm -hmm. through this uh, album. And uh, so, so this is a, it kind of, it's the first time in, the, in Chinese history is to try to at such large scales and as by implication solve the one domestic problem. It's, it's a fascinating how to see how this works. Okay, we'll just have time for a couple of questions if you just any just one um, anyone else? Um, a question. Um, mine's kind of a two part question, but uh, as you said, transparency is one of the major concerns of the PRI. Um, so far, there's been more emphasis on bilateral uh, sort of agreements, I guess, between China and member states, rather than looking at a multilateral approach. I understand it's still in its early stages. Um, but what kind of institutions do you think um, will be or can be used to ensure that the projects are transparent? Um, and then with this increased transparency at uh, this transnational level, um, how do you think that might affect Chinese domestic policy? Yeah. Quick one. Uh, yeah, interesting um, diagram here. Uh, um, but the re resource of Africa uh, have been sought by everyone over centuries. Does China have... Um, a, um, an organized policy to develop more than just those coastal regions of Eastern Africa? Or, uh, and, and does debt versus resources play into that game? Yeah. And if I can just add a final, sort of more Australian question to this. Um, you know, because the big debate here at the moment, I, I think if you've, there, there's been a couple of things in the Lowy, uh, the, the Lowy Institute blog piece. Uh, whatever they call it, uh, on whether Australia should join the, the, the BRI. It, it, it's not, it, it, it does seem to be a matter of domestic politics in Australia, right? Okay. I mean, we're cutting through, I mean, interesting, cutting through both parties, you know, so, um, I mean, it's not a, it, it doesn't seem to be a partisan thing, but they're, they're a, they're, there's a clear political divide in Australia as to whether, you know, Australia should, should, uh, should be in, in, in the BRI. And it, it, it sort of speaks to some of the, you know, precisely some of the domestic politics issues that they've talked about. Yeah. Uh, so it's not just Myanmar, Pakistan, or Sri Lanka, but it, it's Australia as well. Mm -hmm. So this uh, um, bilateral agreement, uh, bi this uh, bilateral approach and a multilateral approach. So if we look at the action plan developed by this uh, three ministry, so they mentioned this issue that China should develop uh, both through the bilateral but also multilateral. So multilateral so far the, what they do the, in the financial sector is uh, uh, a, a Asian investment infrastructure bank. So that's the way. In security area is through this uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So they expand this organization address wider range of issues. 
So, so, but uh, then the issue is uh, how does we affect the domestic politics? I, I don't know. You might give me an answer. I, I can't see any impact. Because the, we thought this, uh, they are certainly constrained the power of the CCP <coughs> at the global level, regional level. But it's difficult to get constrained CCP power at domestic. I, 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 I have no answer, but I, let me know what you have. This uh, Africa, the <coughs> this, uh, debt and the resource issue, East Africa, so certainly this is a the one, 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 one of the possible way the, uh, is the, at the moment is it, 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 really uh, uh, learn from Chinese experiences. So China, look at the early stage of the development. China also had a huge debt. They borrowed money from the World Bank in early days. But then later on, they quickly pay all the back, all the debt. So, so, so the, 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 this uh, kind of debt trap, debt trap. And China was successful to address the debt trap through this uh, development, through the industrialization. So in the Africa or in the South Asia, one of the issues at the moment, if you have is to what extent China really help build local economy, build the local industrialization program, and to address the debt. So this is already happening in Pakistan, but we need to look at this issue result in the next decades. So what's happened is that the China were in the uh, Fed, Pakistan is a federal country. So when the, when the government makes the deal, the other states are not happy. So they went to Beijing and also protest against this central government. So then Beijing holds a meeting in order to implement the album. If you have other, a few state uh, uh, opposition, that would be con con bad consequence. So in order to please all the state, so China promised that each state, they will develop an uh, industrial zone. So it's a, really it's a kind of industrial uh, um, uh, oriented program. That is, they will build the investment, develop the industry. So if that really happens, those industries can generate capital profit. Then they can pay back the debt. That, that is China successfully in the 1980s, the Sri Lanka, the model so far, to pay the debt, you let your high ownership. That's not what, not uh, uh, right answer. Right answer is really develop this uh, local industrialization. And uh, Pakistan is a testing case whether Pakistan can address this debt issue in the next decades. Okay. Oh, the, the Australia case. Yes, sorry. <coughs> The, 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 um, Australia, I, I, I think that Australia, the, 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 this issue is that the, we, we need a, uh, there's a no way you can separate from geopolitical consideration. You have to consider all that. There's a no way you can you, uh, there's no way Australia can stop, plus America, stop Chinese elders. So that means if you wait and say, no, wait, that's our lowest uh, uh, policy recommendation, but say, that is more like say that what happened on the ground will impact the region. So you will be outsiders. You, you will be outsiders. So China will be influenced there. You will be outsiders. So that, that's. So, so, so one option maybe you will be involved in the process like AIB. So you are the one of the member, founding member. So you can walk through the China, with China with other player, and you shaping this AIB. <coughs> you, you, so if you look at the AIB, the the regulation, 
the rule um, largely the exit copy the WTO a World Bank. So is it still it's not the is it still the international standard? So one of the way rather than you are the part of it, then you can influence the Chinese behavior. Then you are part of the influence this region. If you stay away, okay, for China, if you are out, I don't care. You know, I don't care. You know. So I would do things on, on my own anyway. And I would, I would get my influence. So, so, so for realistic option, probably, is to try to get involved in the subtle way rather than wait and see. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure the subtlety is that at the, at the moment, the, the flare of the mounting camera, but we can, uh, we can wait and see. Um, look, um, I'd like to thank you, and, and, and you know, incredibly comprehensive analysis. I think, um, you know, the, when you talk about the OBR, we expect you to be an expert on South Asia, on, on East Africa, you know, on Pakistan, and, and you've done incredibly well in. in you know that when I, pre uh, when I do that, uh, one thing I learned, so I, I just reflect on my personal experience. So when I first arrived in Australia, later on, uh, I, I accumulated a little bit of money, saved a bit of money. When I went back to China, then I can be a millionaire. You know, when that. So I'm what? Because millionaire. But suddenly I, I, I have no idea what is called billing. I have no idea. Now I'm figured out what is a billing. And <laughs> now I'm still struggle trying to figure out the training. What does <laughs> training mean? I, I haven't figured out a billing. That is the equivalent of that's the training I still don't know. <laughs> this is uh, why it's a, uh, really challenging. In that mathematics. <laughs> that, that very good. Well, thank you, very, thank you very much. And I think that domestic politics angle is really perceptive and gives us a different perspective on the, the the BRI. So thank you very much. Again, thanks for coming. You know, it's been a great audience, so thanks.